his computer. Okay, so where do we leave off? We've been in chapter seven of Revelation for quite some time, but could I take this little break in there on our upcoming uh, meal that we're putting on as Master uh, Men okay, on the sixth of okay. March? Yeah, uh, I will be in Colorado getting my granddaughter married as of the twenty eighth to the fourth. You're not talking so the microphone. If there's a people. period there that I'm not uh, going to be available, but I'm setting up all the pizza stuff and so forth. Mary is the point man here in town. He's really the guy that's taking the brunt of it since I'm not going to be here beforehand. But I went over and started up yesterday the same pizza outfit that Mike gave us a good deal a while ago. We're happy to have us back and we told how much we appreciated their home. But uh, it will be organized by Larry if I, while I am gone. However, I'll be back two nights before um, the event. Okay. And when I get back, I'll go over and finalize the pizza, get it ready. Well, we're going to have a we'll have a meeting in between. We have a meeting next Friday. Right. Yeah. So we'll do so. Yeah. No. So next Friday it's business okay. meeting. So we'll take care of the details then. Okay. Good. I won't be here. No, I know. Okay. So got to go. So I got to go smoothly. Thank you. Thank you. All you all are doing that. Thank you. I'm not here. Thank you. I'll be here for the event, Lord willing. Okay, let's let's move on. So, you you have your hand out. Anyway, we've been several weeks in chapter seven. I always wonder how long you can spend in one chapter. There's a lot of stuff there where you can move around and and um, do things there. So if um so we you know we talked about the hundred and forty four thousand we talked about the Jehovah's Witness view of the hundred and forty four thousand some weeks ago, and um, because they they are big you know on that, and uh, last week we talked about the twelve tribes we talked about well what happened to Dan what happened to Ephraim you know why aren't they in the list and you all had those maps if anybody else wants those colored maps I got a few left. But anyway, but on there, you know, you, you have all those, the 12 tribes that went all through the Old Testament. And all of a sudden we get to this rendering of the 12 tribes in um, uh, here in Revelation. And the tribes aren't the same, you know, and the order is not the same. And But anyway, but Dan and Ephraim were gone. Deacon Dennis. Yes, uh, the other day coming across the road from Las Vegas area, the... Uh, I heard an interview on the Christian radio station, and uh, they were interviewing a, a woman from the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. And uh, they said they had heard a rumor that they had increased the number of 144,000. She said, yes, they did. But our, our elder group, their leaders, uh, had a vision that they increased the numbers. And she didn't know to what, but it was a significant increase. So uh, they came to him in a dream. And, uh, wow. Well. You know what? I think she doesn't know what she's talking about because I've looked into this currently, and there's I find nothing on their website that says anything, you know, about you know I, about I, that. I, I, I thought it was rather interesting. I had yeah. anything in general. But there, but see that number, yeah. See, but that number really doesn't. It in in, in the, even in their theology, that number really doesn't mean anything because those are just the ones that are going to be in heaven but people even in our theology when it talks about the new heaven and the new earth and i saw the new jerusalem coming down and you know i mean there's a great earthly presence uh but it's a new it's a new heaven and a new earth so they they really don't need to increase it because they'll never they would never be able to increase it enough for all the people who have lived over time whether they're actually Jehovah's Witnesses or not, I mean, you could rate, you could double the number from 144,000. What would that be? 288,000, and then 10 years from now, that still wouldn't be enough. So then they would have to, you know. And I, I don't even think it's that big of a deal in their own, you know, in their own theology. But I've checked on it recently, and I find nothing in their website, Larry. But it's the carrot they hang in front of them. That's why they work so hard. Well, well, that that, that could be. I mean. You know, like that. But you know, ever since, I don't know when they put out the no vacancy sign, 
you know, like that. But ever since then, people have known that there's no carrot out there for them to get to, you know, get to that, you know, get to that level. But anyway, my, well, anyway, the whole thing wasn't about Jehovah's Witness. My only thing about bringing them into it was the fact that more people know about the 144,000 because Jehovah's Witnesses have always spoken about that. Christians, I think about when was the last time you talked to anybody and said, hey, let me explain to you the 144,000 here in the book of Revelation. You know, you don't, we, it would come up in a Bible study, but you wouldn't be out talking to people about it. Right, do your microphone. Do you need another microphone? Well, it says in Revelation 7, 9 through 17, there's a great multitude that no one could number. Well, we'll talk. We'll talk about that if we get that. If we get that far today, we'll talk. We'll we'll talk about whether or not that's the same group or not, or if it's um, that group plus more more people. But I agree. It's it's it's. Down somebody to measure the temple and the outside of the temple and all the people that are going right, to be in the temple. Right. Right. And we'll get into that as we as we go along. So anyway. Uh, Carl, can you read Revelation 7, 5 through 8? Let's just go through the 12. Um, let's just go through the 12 tribes again. Oops. 5 to what? I don't know, whatever I said. Jim 5 to 8. 7. 5 to 8, okay. yeah. Okay. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of Ishkar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulon, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. From the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000. Okay, good. So he's listed them. Now, right before that, in verse 2, when he said, Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God, and he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given the power to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. You know, and so I had spoken and I said, you know, I think that these 144,000 symbolic of the church that's on earth today, the church, what we call the church militant, the church that's already passed and gone to heaven, you know, mm -hmm. is the church triumphant, which I think is a lot of the ones from nine through 13 or whatever those verses are. But I think that he's preparing the church here. He's got the 12,000 representing the whole church, the, uh, whether it be the Old Testament saints or the New Testament apostles, whoever it might be, and he's going to seal them. And he's going to seal them, I think, for the battle that they're going to have to do down here on earth. You know, when a church is faithful, they go through trouble. They go through hard times, you know, and that they, and that they need that protection from, uh, from God. So that's why I mentioned last week, and I think I put in the email that I sent out yesterday, is to let's read uh, Paul's rendering in Ephesians 6, where he talks about putting on the armor of God, because I think somehow in here, that's part of God's sealing of his people in preparing them for what they have to do to give them, um, you know, to give them protection against, you know, against whatever. Um, let's see, it's 6, 14 through 20. You want me to read it or you want to read it, Carl? I'll read it. Okay, so it's, wait, wait, let's make sure everybody can get there. If you haven't turned there, it's Ephesians 6, verses 14 through through 20. Okay. Everybody ready? No. Stand firm. Wait, wait, wait. Let me, let me, excuse me. Uh, start at verse 10. I'm sorry. Yeah, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. 
Put on the full armor of God, so that you can take your stand against the devil's teeth. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert always, keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me, that wherever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Okay, very good. Thank you. So here's the thing. It's called the whole armor of God. You know, it's God's armor. Uh, Hudson. Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 20. Okay. Anyway, so the main thing is it's the whole armor of God. It's not our armor. You know, I got it. it's like, like God has given us the armor and he's telling us to put it on. And to me, I think it's that ceiling, you know, that he's given us stuff is that, um, you know, we're wearing the things, think about this, we're wearing the things from God's closet, you know? It's like he opens his closet and says, here's my armor, I want you to wear it. Now, Paul doesn't just make this stuff up. This is the important part about knowing your Old Testament. Because remember, the Old Testament is all these guys had, it's all that Jesus had, it's all that the apostles had. It's all that anybody had. There was no New Testament until some years after Jesus died. I mean, it was written down, you know, maybe in the 50s, 60s, 70s, like that. But it was probably orally transmitted shortly after he died. But none of this was written down to where Paul would say, I wonder what Peter thought about this. You know, you know, Peter and I, you know, we kind of run into each other while we're doing our missionary work and we're setting up churches. And I'm reading this something, or I remember somebody said Jesus said something. I wonder what Peter thought. So I'm going to go turn to 1 Peter and 2 Peter. There was no 1 Peter and 2 Peter, you know, back then. It all comes out of the Old Testament. And so what we have to be is we have to be familiar enough now, I'd said all this um, apocalyptic and spectacular stuff all comes out of Ezekiel and Daniel and Isaiah. But this armor of God comes out of the Old Testament, too. It comes out, and I'm making a case here for Isaiah. You know, in, in Isaiah 59, you don't have to turn to these. I'll just read this just so you get the idea, you know, of them. You know, God says he goes to war for his people, and he says, he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede when his own arm brought him salvation in his righteousness of health. And he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. Sound familiar? Isaiah 59. Yeah. Uh, the image of the sword of the spirit comes from Isaiah 11. He said, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek on the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. You know, so in both cases, we've got a weapon that comes out of Jesus' mouth, which is the, um, you know, sword of the Spirit is the word of God. 
like that. The belt of truth is also in Isaiah 11. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. Um, the part about, um, uh, you know, his feet being fit for readiness, uh, you know, from the gospel of peace is from Isaiah 52. He says, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. And that is the peace of God, is knowing that your God reigns. You know, so he's talking about the feet of the one who brings the good news. Somebody brings news, you know, your army is far off, you know, they're on the other side of the lake fighting Californians. And like that, and there's victory, you know, and we beat the Californians like that. So a messenger comes over, he takes the ferry, you know, but he has to run, from, but he has to run from the ferry over here to IHOP. But it's his feet that are bringing him here with the good news of God's glory, you know, God's victory. So that's where Paul is getting this thing, have your feet shod, you know, with the I forget the wording that he used to, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah. Anyway, but, uh, hang on a second. But the part where Paul says, you know, uh, put on the right, you know, put on the right shoes, you know, that are going to make you stand firm. And one of the commentaries that I listened to, he was saying that basically the first three, the fellow who was the correct in the top of these shoes is what you're supposed to put on but the other ones you're supposed to have ready available for usage, but not necessarily put them on or have them, you know, ready. I, you know, I don't know the difference, but mm -hmm. that's fine. I mean, I just don't, you know, I, I don't know. I'd have to listen to the whole thing that he said, you know, where he was, um, you know, where he was going, so. The shield of faith, okay? Now, this one I might stretch a little bit. You know, but in Isaiah 31, he says, Like birds hovering, so the Lord of hosts will protect Jerusalem. He will protect and deliver it. He will spare and rescue it. So he's got like those birds hovering like a shield, you know? Like, it's not like I said, I might stretch it a little bit there, but um, but it works for my lesson. Here, you know, and that's all that counts. <laughs> but anyway, but my but my point is is that you know Paul speaks about what it takes to protect ourselves, and he's specific about saying that it's God's armor that we are to put on. You know, and I think this goes back to what it's saying about the ceiling, because what you know what else. Would, I can't. I can't imagine because you know, we always say, "Yeah, he puts his seal on us." But what is that, and how does that help us? Just like we're not going to put on armor. I mean, I'm not going to go out and get one of those, you know, Spaniard gold helmets that they used to wear with the fluffy short pants, and you know. <laughs> oh, <what a> <laughs> <All right>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but. But but it's talking in the same way. It's it's a matter of protecting yourself. You know, you we you put on armor. You know, most of your armor isn't offensive. Most of your armor is defensive. It's protective. You know, you put on a shield. You put on a helmet. You know, um, you just do that stuff to protect you. And I think that's what the seal is. Anybody have any thoughts on that, Denny? Yeah, I, I don't know exactly where it is in scripture, but we we God had warned us several times that there will be many false prophets and false uh, teachers arise. So don't you think this is kind of putting on the armor protection against that? Yeah, well, he talks about the fiery darts of the wicked one. Yeah, you know, like that. Yeah, I mean, and those darts aren't real. I mean, it's not like he's firing arrows at you, but it's the same type of thing. Whatever he's attacking you with, the armor of God or God's seal, however you want to do it, is what protects you. You know, when it talks about, you know, um, uh, this, what did it say? The, uh, um, 
and I should memorize these, huh? When he talks about the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, you know, our sword that we're going to use is the word of God. The best thing you could do when you run into false prophets or you run into people that are just loco on what they're trying to teach, the only thing you can go back to, you know, is the word of God. And it's like you're in a duel, you know, with the false teachers, you know. But it, it says, I think in Hebrews, it says that, you know, it's sharper than a two-edged sword, uh, you know, the word of God, when it's speaking about the word of God. So, it, again, that's why you need to know, you know, you need to know the scripture. So many people, somebody comes along and says, did you know? Or, hey, let me tell you what I found in the Bible. You know, I don't know why all the teachers have been covering it up from you, but they've been keeping it from the church. But you hear this a lot, you know, and it's like, no, no, here, it's right here. Boom. Like, who, somebody had a hand. Oh, Dennis. About three canonical traditions passed. They came with that one. We talk about this thing here. Uh -huh. But uh, the king or spiritual warfare, and all of these things were discussed during the period of those four days. And uh, I understand that it was, it was very, very interesting. It's something they never really dealt with in a, at that time. But uh, you know, I never saw a thing come down in our church, as an example, what was discussed and what was, I don't know what they ended up with, but it was uh, all these scriptures. I remember we read some of these dug on. But uh, the, for the synod to say that that was their major theme, I thought yeah. that was rather revealing, I thought. But I did not expect that. Yeah. Didn't the, um, you, you know, the thing is, is that churches are good for kind of protecting the people when they're in the church building. You know, you're not going to hear anything bad when you're in the church building. But we don't prepare people to go... Outside, I give I give you a good, good example. This would be a rabbit trail, which wouldn't be unique. But um, anybody ever have any dealing with the people in the Hebrew roots movement? Hebrew roots. Hebrew yeah. roots. Oh, anyway, this, and, and they're getting to be they're getting to be bigger and bigger. But what they're doing is they're, they say they're going back to the Hebrew roots of the Christian faith. Okay, but what they are is. Uh, they want every all Christians to have to follow all the laws, all, all you know, the whole Torah laws, the Sabbath, the dietary laws, just all the laws. You have to observe all the um, festivals, the Jewish festival. Pardon? Circumcision. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you would, you know, and um, and so what they say is no, you know. The new covenant that we're under is just the, my paraphrase, is just the um, old covenant, but it's now written on your heart instead of in a book, you know? And they'll say that the law doesn't save you. Jesus still saves you. But if you're going to be honoring to God, you follow all the, you know, you follow all the laws. And... Uh, they just don't get it because who see everybody wants and this is this will sound paradoxical everybody wants the easiest way to do christianity and the easiest way to do christianity is this is the paradox part is to give me the list of rules so i know what to follow give me the list of rules so i know what it means to be a good christian and not just hear a message like Pastor Skip's great at, you know, doing this. Pastor Cave was really good at doing it too. Is is preaching? God has done it all Christ, through Christ. God has done it all. You don't have to worry about anything. That doesn't mean that you're not going to be obedient to things because we follow the laws of Christ versus the laws of the Torah, you know. But, um, yeah, but see, people always want to know. And you'll find a lot of evangelical churches, they'll stand up there and they'll preach to you what it means to be a good Christian. And they give you the list. And you walk out of the church and you feel really good. I have my list. 
you know? And then by Tuesday, you realize you haven't kept anything on the list and now you're in despair, you know? And you just feel like crap, you know, like that. Until you go back to church and you get your list, you know, again. So anyway, but anyway, but that goes back to what Denny's talking about, about, you know, um, uh, false prophets and, you know, false teachings and that is how do you react, you know, to it, you know, and I see you guys, you know, if, uh, so if you ran into someone who's a Jehovah's Witness, Jehovah's Witness is kind of the same thing, you know, because they'll say, you know, um, uh, they're real law oriented, you know, but then they'll say Jesus isn't God. A lot of these Hebrew roots, people say God, uh, Jesus isn't God, you know. And, um, but do you know where to take them in the Bible to counteract? You may not get them to believe it, but at least they can't walk away and say it wasn't in the Bible because they were shown what was in the Bible. I don't know, Carl? Ray. Or Ray. Okay, Ray. Yeah, I was just wondering if Christian nationalism plays into part of this thing that's going on right now. Um. Well, does everybody know what Christian nationalism is now or what it's being portrayed as, you know, now? It's well, think back to the think back to January 6th, okay? What happened at January 6th and half the people there were carrying Bibles and crosses and stuff like that to where they to where they think that um uh, uh that uh, the meaning of being a Christian is to rule through government not to rule through the church or stuff like that, but that we have this, um, what they used to call it, manifest destiny, you know, to, um, to and it's a big deal now, but I think what it is, is I, I don't think it's as big of a deal as people make of it. Obviously, if you guys haven't heard about it, it's not that big of a deal, but it, um, is that, um, I lost my, I lost my train of thought where I was going with it. But anyway, so what we're, uh, Ray asks, is that the same thing? If, if someone says, um, if someone says that, uh, I don't get in trouble, here, but this is to me. If, if somebody says America's a is is um, you know God's nation or God, America's a Christian nation, you know, that's that's not what the gospel talks about. You know, um, but by the same token, but by the same token, you don't want to not recognize the fact that we do have a Christian heritage, you know, that they can't. But I think that's because Christians came here. But I mean, how do you have a Christian nation? They can't baptize a nation. No, serious. You can't baptize. You can't. If we we're a Christian nation, churches would be packed. Literally packed. How many people would go to churches that are packed? We, when we have winter visitors, get pretty close to, <laughs> you know, get pretty close to that. But that's only because we've stolen out of other churches, you know. But um, I don't know if I want to go any further than that. Oh, what were you going to say, Carl? I think the people that are going and getting the list from their churches are going to the wrong place to get their list. They need to get their I, list from there. I fully, it's our job I, to teach them how to find I, the list in here. I, I, I fully agree. See, that's the difference between, yeah, you know, and I've said this before, you know, there's only two religions in the world. Only two religions. There's Christianity and all the rest. Okay, and it sounds exclusive, you know, it sounds exclusionary, like we're telling everybody else they're wrong. Like that. But see, Christianity is also the most open religion in the world because anybody can become a Christian. But anyway, so the difference is, is that Christianity, you know, the main word is done. Everything's been done. All the other religions, I don't care who they are. Like that. The, the Jews, Islam, Buddhism, you know, whoever is do. Here's your list. This is what you've got to do. If you want to attain um, heaven or you want to have some connection with God, however the, all these different religions would word it, here's what you've got to do. And in Christianity, it's 
you know, it's done. And again, I think that's why God has sealed the church, is I've done it, I'm protecting, I'm protecting mine. Did somebody say something? I just said, oh, I'm sorry? It's finished. Yeah, it's finished. It, it, and people don't recognize that. You know, when Jesus said it's finished, the question is, what is finished? You know, that's where, and that's where the Hebrew roots people are wrong is to try to tell them, no, Jesus lived out the law perfectly for us because we can't do it. And as soon as we try to take the law back, we're saying, yeah, I know, Jesus, I know you died on the cross, but I've got to do what you say you did. And they take back. Yeah. Rick. Paul had that battle with uh, Peter. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and that's that, that. That is one thing you're talking about with the eating with the Gentiles. Yeah, you and know, that's a, that. Pardon? Circumcision. And circumcision is that in, in um, what Paul was uh, see, and this is one thing I've been talking a lot with these um, Hebrew roots people online. But is like they say, well, Peter would never eat unclean foods. I go, no, he was sitting at the table with the Gentiles. You know, and when the Jewish people from James came in, he jumped up, switched tables. And why would he do that? Because he it's not like he can't associate with Gentiles because they were there as missionaries starting up church. And he was eating Wendy's double bacon cheeseburgers with them, you know, and that he got up because because in there, Paul says something about, you know, I forget the wording, but. Because how can you do that? Because you're living like a Gentile. And how does it, I mean, not saying bad, he's just, he's doing what the Gentiles do, not necessarily what the, you know, what the Jews do. That's just Al walking out. He's radioactive. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, yeah, Carl. It seems we're, we've come, our conversations come a circle, we're right back to being sealed. And you had said something earlier about... Do you like them? Yeah. You had said something earlier about not uh, being sure of what the seal is. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit. Right, well... That's the only seal we get. Right, no, I, I know that, but I'm trying to put... Um, I'm, I'm trying to put... Hold on a second, I'm trying to put flesh on it. But I'm trying to say... Because what, is that, what does that even mean? I, You know, it's like... Again, when when Paul's talking about the full armor of God, he's not talking about armor. He's talking about that ceiling. He's talking about that protection. So whether we say it's something that gets put on our forehead, whether it's the Holy Spirit in us, or if it's just recognizing what the um, you know what the sword of the Spirit is, or whatever you know like that, it's that stuff that gives us God's God's protection. Wait, wait, uh, Denny's. Um, then he sits way in the back, so he gets, even though he wears red, so I'll notice him. Other rule, take away, say what grace alone. Right. No, no, no. So the thing, the thing with James is, yeah, he's talking about how a another person will recognize that you're a saved person, and that flows from the works that you do. Okay. But again, I said we follow the law of Christ, which is different than the law of Moses. Okay. Well, you see, people say, and, and these, um, and and these people, they say, well, Jesus didn't come and change the law, and I say, yes, he did, because he said, like for the Ten Commandments, you know, thou shalt not murder. But what did Jesus say? You have heard it said. When he says you have heard it said, he's talking about what's written in the Old Testament scripture. He says you have heard it said, thou shalt not murder. But I tell you, if you hate your brother. You've committed the murder. Or you've heard it said that thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say 
if you lust after another woman, you have committed adultery in your heart. He said, you know, we have the Ten Commandments. It lists the Ten Commandments, right? He says, a new law I give you is to love one another. But he said, the first is to love God with your whole heart, soul, mind, you know, the whole the whole bit. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as your... Well, all of a sudden, he took laws that are somewhere in the book of laws, but he elevated them to the top. Please. So, okay, so those are the kind of things that are the law of Jesus that we, you know, that we follow, and not ceremonial laws, which, um, we'll see you, Morgan, which are... Um, Ceremonial laws like circumcision, because Paul talked about, you know, baptism replacing, you know, circumcision, uh, like the Sabbath, like the dietary laws, like, the, you know, like Pentecost. You know, Pentecost was looking forward to something. And then the day of Pentecost comes when the Holy Spirit's given, you know, to the church. So why would you go back and celebrate Old Testament Pentecost or you know, all of those. So it's a, it's a, um, you know, it's a fine issue. I don't want to get into the angels dancing on the head of a, you know, a pin, but, but we do it so that people see that we're saved. We don't do it to stay in God's good grace. And that's what the old Testament laws were all about. Somebody had something. Oh, Ray. Isn't, isn't the whole thing about spiritual warfare basically just trying to plant seeds of doubt yeah. Right. And, you know, and that's why he's, well, how come there's only 66 books in the Bible? What happened to the Apocrypha? What happened to the book of, uh, you know, you know Epoch or whatever? And they're just trying to say, hey, you're not getting all of it. Yeah. But the minute they plant that doubt in your mind and you start doing all this other stuff, they got you. And the best thing you can do what was is Satan's, put on the armor. What was Satan's first sin? Or first challenge to Eve. Yeah, did God really say? And see, when people say that, like what Ray was saying, well, no, you have all these other books that didn't make it into the Bible because that's where the good stuff is hidden. And they don't want you to know that stuff because of what they're really saying is, God, did God really say? Like that. And then if you know enough of your Bible, then you can go back and say, well, let's talk about this. You know, when somebody says that they, hang on, Larry, when somebody says that they have an objection to, um, you know, to Christianity or to God, you know, when somebody comes out and they say, well, I'm an atheist, what do you say to them? Sorry, Larry. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, you ask them, why are you an atheist? And you know, one of the more common answers that people give is, well, because there's so many contradictions in the Bible. Mm -hmm. See, but then we want to come back and say, well, can you name them? Yeah, but you don't want to, you don't want to do that. See, what you want to do to people like that is they go, I'm an atheist. And you go, why are you an atheist? And you go, well, there's too many contradictions in the Bible. And then you say, well, let's grant that there's contradictions in the Bible. Does that say anything about whether or not God exists? You know, I mean, if it said that, you know, so-and-so's army had 7,000 troops, and in another book it says the same guy had 70,000 troops, you know, I what, whatever these things are, does that say anything about whether or not God exists? Because that's the claim that an atheist would make, is that there's no God, and the reason he's an atheist is because, you know, is because of that, and... But see, you have to be comfortable in your own knowledge to know there aren't there aren't contradictions. You know, there there might be um, apparent contradictions. You know, but if you got something where something's written fifteen hundred years ago and then something's now, maybe the context is different. You know, if I tell Eric, Eric, uh, when you come over to my house today, just come on in, okay? But Andy, if I think Andy's coming over, I say, Andy, when you come over, ring the doorbell and I'll come and I'll get you. I haven't contradicted anything. I've just said different things in a different context to different people. Al, were you going to say something? Uh, yes, uh, I might be jumping out of context here, but uh, the Missouri, Missouri Synod Lutheran Church denies the common interpretation of the rapture. 
Agreed. Uh, the common interpretation is based on a couple of Bible passages that say two men are working in the field, one man disappears and the other is still there. Yep. Two women are washing clothes by the river, one disappears and the other is still there. And all the televangelists base their interpretation of the rapture on those two passages. Well, yeah, but amongst we others. Deny that. Right. And uh, I don't understand why or how. You know, I understand the Missouri Synod's uh, interpretation of the rapture as being we will be all be put, uh, raised up into the heavens with Jesus Christ when he returns to, to heaven. Right. And uh, I don't understand how. All the televangelists are, are, are continuing how they get to portray it, this. How they get it wrong. Pardon? How they get it wrong. You don't understand how they get it wrong. Because <laughs> no. they get it wrong. Here's the, here's the thing. is Lutheran teaching was around long before the modern day uh, you know, rapture theology. And, and regular, reg, uh, regular Christianity... Orthodox Christianity, old fashioned, good old. What? Well, so that's to wake everybody up. But it's too. Um, no, okay. That that disrupted things. Anyway, is um, Christians have always thought the way the Lutherans think on, on the end times. That's always been the position until into the 1800s. But now the what um, Al says is, yeah, that is the predominant common understanding. Now you turn on any radio station, go to any bookstore, if there's any bookstores left, you know, and, and, and it's all going to be about all the end times rapture theology. But that's the new stuff. And um, it's never been, so it's not like we deny what they say, you know, we just say what we say, and we just keep marching along, and then they come up with this. Everybody likes to read. But, but, Al's, yeah. but Al's right. See, this is the thing about knowing your scripture, is to know where they're getting it from. But if you understand your scripture right, where it says, you know, grinding at the mill, and one is taken, and one is left, where's the one taken to? Taken to judgment. You know, all the people in the flood, you know, the eight were there and left that were left behind. The eight were left behind. The others were taken into judgment. You know, the parable of the um, the uh, wheat and the weeds, the wheat and the tares, is that the, the wheat gets gathered up and put in the barns, and the weeds are taken away to be burned in judgment. And they've got it. These other people, they've got it a hundred percent backwards. But they say it, you know, my old thing, you know, if you say something with enough confidence and loud enough, people are gonna think you're right. And like I said, they own the radio stations, the TV stations, the bookstores, publishing houses. And so most of the stuff you see written is that Larry, and then we're gonna have to So something you said earlier that anyway, I, I somewhat disagreed with. Mm -hmm. I think that the biggest danger for Christians today is the church itself <laughs> because of look at the ELCA what their interpretation I, was they thought nobody had any place to go the blessing was that they went to a more conservative LCMC I just found out a great big church over Mesa went there and so they must be hurting as a synodical for their funds because a thousand or a couple hundred you're, churches you're talking about the ELCA yeah. oh they're, 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 they're that bleeding. danger comes from within they're, they're bleeding they're bleeding out well but see, we have to make sure that we divine, define church right. And the way that Lutherans have always said it is that where, where the word is preached and the sacraments are proper, properly administrated, that is the church. Okay? So when people start getting off from that, you know, but you got to remember, a church is just a congregation of sinners, you know, we never quite get it right. We hold each other accountable, hopefully. And if somebody starts to, you know, run a straight, I mean, if if Pastor Skip, and I'll finish with it, if Pastor Skip comes back from the, these meetings that he's at, and he learns some, 
new teaching. I mean, uh, probably not in the conference, but maybe sitting in the bar with a couple of other pastors and other pastors going, hey, that's that. <laughs> no, no. And he comes, he comes back and say, say that he starts teaching, say that this Hebrew root stuff, that we should be following the old Jewish laws and stuff like that, because I can't believe that it was hidden from me, but now it's been revealed to me, so I'm going to reveal it to you, that we are smart, and I just use him as an example. But I mean, is that people in the church, because we are the body of Christ, that we stand up and say, no, that's not right, instead of saying, well, He's the pastor, so he probably knows. He's been to seminary. He's been to a conference in Phoenix, you know, <laughs> like that. Uh, so we would stand up and we'd say, no, that's not right. Okay, Pastor Callio, then we got to go. Do your microphone. Preach the church version. Right. True gospel. Right. Yeah. Okay. But then the other saying is, and I don't know if he said it or not, where God builds his church. The devil builds a chapel right next door. You know? <laughs> so, okay, right, right, and then we got to go. One of the things that Gene said some time ago. Oh, don't was, blame me. Yeah. <laughs> was called Christian Doctrine by Joel Beerman. Mm -hmm. And there's about 74 videos, and they're, some of them are like two minutes long, some are 20 minutes long. But it covers everything that basically a seminary student would be taking in order to take the entrance exam to go to a seminary. And I would encourage anybody who wants to learn more about a Christian doctrine to get a hold of Gene and have him send you those 74 videos and listen to them. I mean, it's, so much. It's, it's one. It's one YouTube account that has the seventy-four videos in it, so it's not like it's really good. I mean, it, it, it's you it's know, where he, where he teaches, it, he keeps doing people. at the seminary, and it's the summer before a student starts seminary, and what it does is it brushes them up on Lutheran doctrine that they might be weak on, so that when they start seminary classes that fall, uh, they have. Now I think I think it's thirty hours is what it is, but they broke it down by by topics. If anybody wants it, let me know. Would you call that whitewashing? What's that? It's all the rules, all the laws, whatever. In some ways, maybe thinking correctly, but you're not broadening it to make it so. I don't know. It's not hated on. Mm -hmm. It's whitewashed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or you, that cheap paint. You guys okay <laughs> online? Were you able to hear okay for everybody? Are you frozen? I can't tell. Okay, I'm going to turn off the recording. You guys can stay. Uh, where am I doing? Stay.